Good morning. My name is uh, Robert Rapier. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. I uh, gave a similar talk in Duchesne back in July, and I guess they uh, liked what I had to say, so they invited me back up. The only thing is, I've got less time today, so um, I really appreciated uh, Jed's uh, talk just now because he hit on something I had to cut from my presentation, and that was natural gas. So I'm going to change things up a little bit here over some of the presentations you've seen this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do as a company, but I'm going to start off discussing oil prices. And I know that's something that's of interest to everyone in here. And um, I'll spend first uh, third of, or, or probably half of my presentation talking about what's happened in oil prices over the last year. Since 2014, I'm going to give you an understanding of why prices crashed why they've bounced around since then, and why they're likely to come back. I'll talk about some threats to oil. Um, you've heard a lot about probably uh, oil demand peaking by 2030. There's a lot of stories that have come out and said that. I'm going to talk to you about why I don't believe that's true. Um, and then I'll, I'll finish up by talking a little bit about what we do as a company. <clears throat> okay, so. I'll tell you who I am if you don't know me, um, and, and then get into oil prices, why they crashed, is oil demand peaking, and then Zero is the company that I work for right now. You may have seen this big truck parked out front here. Um, we've got a demonstration unit that we've had out in Texas operating, and it is parked out front. Immediately after this talk, I'm going to go out and uh, I'll be available for questions and answers uh, with my colleague Bob Schneider sitting over here in the corner. Um, and, and we'll answer any questions that you have about the, about the unit. Okay, about me. So I've got a, a master's in chemical engineering. I've worked in the energy business for uh, more than 20 years. Um, I've had assignments overseas. I've worked in Germany, Scotland, the Netherlands. Um, I've done a lot of different things in energy, and currently I am uh, director of alternative fuels for a company called Zero in uh, Chandler, Arizona. I, besides being a chemical engineer and working in the energy business, I write a lot, and I, I do media appearances and so forth about energy, broad energy picture, um, you know, oil, natural gas, uh, across the spectrum, solar power, so forth and so on. I've got a regular weekly column for Forbes. Um, you can go there, and the latest thing I wrote was about uh, the ethanol mandates and how it's affecting refiners. Uh, I cover a lot of ground, not just, uh, not just oil and gas, but... Uh, uh, like, I, like I said, whole energy spectrum. I'm also chief energy strategist for Investing Daily. I write a, a subscription column and two free weekly columns just trying to describe to the layman, you know, what's happening in the, in the energy sector. So let's look at the supply side of oil. Over the past, since about 2008, since the shale boom really got going, U.S. oil production went up by about 5 million barrels a day between 2008 and 2014. That is the fastest growth rate in the 150-year history of the U.S. oil industry, which is remarkable. It wasn't expected. Uh, the world didn't expect the U.S. to put uh, 5 million barrels a day on the market. We have been in decline since 1970. Uh, the, you know, the, Trent, the Alaska pipeline uh, flattened things out a little bit, but then we went into decline again, and it was believed by many a decade ago that we would continue to just uh, suffer natural decline, and, and, um, and then the shale boom came along. And we put 5 million barrels a day on the market. To put that in perspective, that is more oil than was produced by any other major region in the world. It's more than all of OPEC produced, it's more than Saudi, it's more than Russia. Uh, it accounted for most of the new production in the world over that time frame. But OPEC responded to this production. Now, you can see this is a rig count. Rig count as oil production, as, as oil prices were at $100, a rig count went up uh, pretty sharply. And in November 2014, on Thanksgiving Day, OPEC had a meeting and it was expected that they would come out of that meeting and decide to cut production a little bit to keep prices from falling. What had happened in the summer of 2014, oil prices had been bouncing around $100. And coincidentally, I was looking stupid because I had predicted that oil prices would fall in 2014. That was, uh, I make predictions at the beginning of every year. One of my 2014 predictions was $100 oil is not sustainable. It has to fall. We've got inventories that are piling up. 
and uh, too much production is economical below $100, expect oil prices to fall. By July, I was still wrong. Uh, oil prices had gone up somewhat, so people were, were suggesting, you know, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Oil prices now are, uh, are above where you said they, where, where you said they would fall, uh, and then they dramatically fell. They uh, started to fall in late July. By the time of the OPEC meeting, we had gone down from about $100 to about $75 or $80. And it was expected by many that OPEC would come out and say, you know, we're going to take a little bit of this excess production off the market and balance the market. And instead, they came out and said, we're going to defend market share. And when they said that, you can see the time of that meeting, the rig count in the U.S. plummeted. Coming out of that meeting, on a longer presentation, I show what happened with oil prices. Oil prices took about a $20 dip coming out of that meeting. Now, if you listen to what OPEC said at the time, they thought they would put most shale oil production out of business at $60. Um, they thought probably oil prices might dip down to 60. Bankruptcies would occur all over the place. They would get their market share back. And it didn't work that way. And if you uh, read some of what they said afterwards, uh, they certainly didn't expect oil prices to fall to as low as they did. I mean, it hurt them a lot. It's still hurting them. Uh, Venezuela's in chaos over oil prices. A lot of the OPEC members are hurting badly. Now, at, um, and, and why did they decide to do that? If you look back at the history of OPEC, back during the uh, OPEC embargo in 1973, OPEC had 51% market share of global oil production. After that, the U.S. instituted a bunch of new energy policies. Uh, we we uh, made sure that we were not going to be as dependent and in that situation again as OPEC, where they basically quadrupled oil prices on us in just a couple of years and created the gas lines, and, and many of you still remember what that was like. Well, they lost market share then for the next, uh, for the next decade. They lost a lot of market share. And so a lot of people believe that OPEC sort of saw the handwriting on the wall. They saw shale production uh, increasing year after year, and they decided to take action. Now, if you, you see, they were still at 42% market share. I mean, they lost a couple percent market share as a result of the shale boom. Uh, but a lot of members felt like, you know, if we don't do something now, shale guys are going to continue to take market share. And so that's the reason they did it. It's not the move I would have made. I've, I've criticized them before. Um, my, my most popular article I ever wrote for Forbes was called OPEC's Trillion Dollar Miscalculation. That move is going to cost them a trillion dollars. Um, will they ever make that back? I doubt it. I doubt they'll ever make that back because they did not put shale out of business. Uh, shale's still going strong. It cut, uh, you, you guys cut a lot of production costs. Uh, you know, there are people still hurting at, uh, you know, 40, lower 40s right now. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that, uh, you know, this, this industry is going to go on. And, and as oil prices recover, which I believe they will, um, you know, we'll see shale still produce a lot of oil in the U.S. Now, here's what happened as a result. Um, you know, I, I tell people there are two parts to the oil price crash. There's all the oil the U.S. producers put on the market. And even though there was an export ban in place, what, that, what happened was all that production pushed out imports, pushed those imports onto the global markets, and that affected price. Inventories piled up. I've got to circle around the problem. Global crude oil inventories started to pile up, and that is ultimately what crashed the price. So there's two parts. U.S. producers put 5 million barrels a day on the market. OPEC responded by dumping about another 2 million barrels a day onto an already oversupplied market. So we got the crash. Now, if you look out into the future, you can see the market is starting to tighten. Inventories are starting to come down already. Uh, it's going to take probably until 2017 sometime before we really see uh, significantly diminished inventories. We have a very large inventory overhang. I expect still a lot of volatility in the, in the region we're in now. I don't see oil dropping back into the 30s, but it's getting close. I view $30 oil as a, as a no-brainer investment. I mean, oil at that level is not sustainable. Oil production cannot meet global demand at that price over the long term. So, um, you know, if we do pull back, I'm loading up and I'm buying as much as I can at those prices. So let's talk about oil demand. I get into more arguments with people about oil demand. And uh, 
I've written a lot about coal over the years, and I've warned about coal. I've said coal is on its way out. Uh, coal will be around for a long time, but it's not going to be a growth industry. Coal and oil are very different, and I have people tell me that, uh, you know, the oil market is going to follow the coal market, and I, I spend a lot of time explaining why I don't believe that's true. So you might have seen some of the stories. Uh, there was a big one in Bloomberg earlier in the year, how electric cars will cause the next oil crisis. And I was heavily critical of that article because they made a very fundamental mistake. And I think it shows up on the next slide, and that is this. Oil demand, underlying oil demand is growing by more than a million barrels a day, year after year after year, and it's done so for more than 30 years. There are some very small hiccups here and there. The uh, financial crisis of 2008, you saw oil demand dip, but then it jumped back up strongly, jumped back up onto the demand line. The Bloomberg analysis, what they did is they assumed static oil demand. They assumed oil demand today, and they assumed that if we could put electric cars on the market at 60% a year, which is well beyond what they're growing at, that by 2023, that could impact 2 million barrels a day of oil demand. Today's oil demand. Underlying factor is oil demand growing at a million barrels a day means by then, oil demand would be 7 million barrels a day higher than it is today. So electric cars in Bloomberg's very optimistic scenario might mean that oil demand is only 5 million barrels a day higher today than instead of 7. And what they assumed is 2 million barrels lower than today, and that precipitates an oil crisis. Those kind of analyses abound. The peak demand analyses like that, you know, I've got nothing at all against electric cars, but the reality is if you do the math, you can see those type of analyses do not hold up. They require you to ignore a lot of factors. And I'll show a case study in a minute of a country that has seen triple digit demand growth in electric cars over the past seven years, and oil demand didn't do what you would think it would do. Other headline story always, Chinese demand is softening. I saw a story yesterday, weakening Chinese demand. Uh, I've seen this story every year repeated, weakening Chinese demand. Well, there's Chinese crude oil imports, and you can see that, in fact, some quarters do see demand dips, and people make the mistake of extrapolating that into China's demand is weakening. There are many places there where the demand jumps well above the curve, and it all has the net impact of steadily, consistently growing Chinese demand over time. So when you hear these stories, China's oil imports are down or Chinese demand is down, remember two things. One is that that may be true this quarter, but historically that will average out to, to growth. There will be a quarter that jumps way up above, above the line. The other thing to remember is India's demand growth is where China's was about a decade ago. India's growing oil consumption at, at double digits. Um, it will put on, a, and, and they also have a strategic reserve that they're trying to fill up. So you will see India move into China's role, even as China's demand ultimately does slow. You'll see, you'll see India, you'll see some of the other Southeastern Asian countries pick up that demand. So for the last, uh, you know, this only goes back to 1949, but since the beginning of the auto industry, Petroleum has had more than a 92% share of the U.S. transportation market. Over the last decade, you can see that biomass and natural gas are growing a little bit. Uh, the biomass there is ethanol. It's mandated in the fuel supply. Uh, we've reached the 10% blend limit, which is a problem for automakers. It's a problem for refiners. Uh, I don't expect to see the same kind of growth rate. In fact, if you look at ethanol over the past decade, it rose sharply from 2005 to 2012, and then it basically flattened out as the, as the uh, blend limit was reached, uh, as the blend wall was reached. Um, it has to do with manufacturers. They won't warranty a car for more than, an older car, especially for more than 10% ethanol blend. Oil producers or, or refiners, they don't want to take the liability, and so demand is kind of stuck. Now, let's talk about electric vehicles for just a second, because it is the number one uh, suspect that people point to in, uh, in why oil demand is going to decline. These are 2014 and 2015 sales figures in the U.S. To put this in perspective, 
16 and a half million gasoline cars sold in 2014, 122,000 electric vehicles. The growth in gasoline cars from 2014 to 2015 is an order of magnitude higher than all of the electric vehicle sales. So it shows that even if, and, and I expect electric vehicle sales will pick back up, uh, but they're not going to grow fast enough to make a dent. This is back to that problem of underlying growing demand, which is growing because of population growth. It's growing because in developing countries, people want to drive and um, you know they, they are, are consuming, there's a lot of people consuming just a little bit more oil and that adds to, um, to oil demand globally. So um, the, the problem with the EVs is they're working against a moving target of oil demand. So Norway is an interesting case study. Norway has the highest per capita EV fleet in the world. Over the past seven years, and I believe I've got this on the next slide, that's what their EV growth looks like in Norway. That is triple digit growth for seven years. And over that time frame, their oil demand, it, it actually goes up. It's, uh, I've circled though the last five years which have been really explosive demand growth and that is oil, oil demand in Norway. Now some might look at this and say, oh but you can see that demand was growing up to that point. I'd point out that countries all around Norway all saw double-digit demand declines during this time period. So, uh, and that's because of higher oil prices, that's because, you know, people are, are trying to drive fewer miles, people are conserving. So the EU as a whole, Norway's not a member of the EU, but the EU as a whole, and neighboring countries all around Norway dropped oil consumption at least 10% over the last five years, and demand in Norway, despite triple-digit growth in electric vehicles, actually grew. So it's back to that problem. Your underlying number of cars on the road went up. Your n underlying number of miles driven went up. And so that's, that's what the EVs are working against. They can't, they're working from such a small base, it's going to take much longer. I don't say they won't ever make a big impact, but it's gonna be much longer than people think. So the conclusions to that part, and I've got four or five slides about what it is that we're doing as a company. Uh, over the past decade, the U.S. has been the world's most important new source of oil, and global oil demand continues to grow robustly. The oil prices crashed because of oversupply. Demand is still very strong, so it's too much demand, I mean, too much supply, even though we had good demand. Uh, the threats to oil's market share are grossly overblown. This is simply a matter of too much oil on the market, and oil is very unlikely to follow coal into the sunset. All right, a few, few slides on what we do as a company. Zero, my company in Chandler, Arizona. So we're, we are trying to tackle associated gas flaring. That may be a problem for some of you. Uh, you've got oil production, you've got very rich gas, and you may not have a good outlet for it, so it's flared. So the problem is associated gas is flared because it is maybe too rich to put in the pipeline. It's uh, inconsistent um, uh, BTU value. You don't have any uh, maybe infrastructure lots of different situations. The solution, we convert that into a consistent stream of methane. So all of the NGLs in there, the ethane, propane, butane, we crack all of those, we reform them, and turn them back into methane. That's what we do. That solution can be different for different people. It may be displacement of diesel. It may be injection then of that methane into the pipeline. It may be power production. Uh, lots of different ways that that can, that can go. So this, I believe, is the unit that we have outside. It fits on a trailer. Um, so it's catalytic gas reforming system, no NGL separation. Um, and basically, we've got units that are 200 kilowatts. And, and what I've been working on over the past uh, six months is one megawatt unit. I think we got the 200 kilowatt here, one megawatt. This thing's got a big water tank on it. One of the improvements we made, we got rid of the water tank. We're now able to use. Uh, uh, tap water, just, just water that's available on site for the most part. Uh, this is what it looks like in the uh, field. We've tested units in the Bakken, in the Eagleford, and in the Permian Basin. Uh, we've got some extensive run time on the smaller units. Our larger one megawatt unit is currently being commissioned in Chandler. We've got it uh, there on site. 
um, reformer, all the, all the, the uh, um, uh, steam production facilities upstream of that. We've been working out all those kinks and uh, uh, that will be going in the field as soon as we get everything worked out there. Uh, our larger unit, this is one megawatt unit, this is kind of a conceptual idea of what it's going to look like out there. We've got, uh, um, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we've done a lot of work on what the footprint will look like, where things will sit. Um, you know, we're working with one of the largest oil producers in North America to site these at, at lo on location. Um, but this is, this is what we expect, these one megawatt modules will be sort of our standard size, and so if somebody wants five megawatts, we'll put five modules sort of like this out there. And the future of the flare, we see several different options, uh, flare going to electricity, which we do, uh, distributed natural gas, which we do, and then flare to liquids, which we're working on. Um, you know, you can take that gas, you can make methanol out of it, you can make synthetic diesel, it's expensive. Um, there may be some niche applications uh, where that works, where you've got really high dollar diesel. And, uh, but, you know, a lot of people have tried to crack that nut, and it's, uh, it's pretty challenging. So, questions, I'll, I, like I said, after this, we're coming up with a break now. I'll be outside. Um, I can answer questions on this. If you want to talk about the oil markets, uh, uh, gas markets, anything in general, I will be available out there. If you want to argue, I'll be on the other end so you can find me down there. I'm kidding. If you want to argue, I, I'll, I'll, I'll argue with you too. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate being here. It's a beautiful part of the country. I've never been right here to this area before. Looking forward to going and seeing Dinosaur National Monument this afternoon. Thank you again. <laughs>